Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Happy Mum, Happy Baby, the podcast. Today's guests, well, they've been on our screens for a long time in Maiden Chelsea. One is an OG, so it really has been a long time. Um, they are on their journey to become parents and I'm really excited to talk to them today. It's Ollie and Gareth Locke. The Lock Locks. Lock Locks? Lock Lock, who's there? Yeah, it's a <laughs> funny situation. <laughs> So technically, yeah, well, I am, I, and I have actually changed my passport. I am Gareth Lock Lock, and you are still Ollie Lock. I'm still Ollie Lock at the moment, but I do need to change it for bus certificate reasons when the babies are born and stuff. Yeah, like we that. need to get on. However, Gareth, actually, the lovely story that Gareth did change his name oh, as a surprise. I'm like, look, I've changed my name. It's wonderful. Look, it's at the proof. It's Lock Lock, and I was like. You know you spelled Gareth wrong. No, so you legally, didn't. So bad. He changed his name to DeGra Lock Lock. <laughs> and I was like, so now in any other document, it's going to have to be, what have you got any previous names? And it's going to be, yeah, it's Gara Lock Lock, <laughs> then Gara Lock Lock. <laughs> so changing your name by Depot, I have my solicitor. I've actually done it for Ollie as well, but I've checked. I have, I've had spelled his name one right. Um, so I changed my name at Depot and I've got terrible eyesight and right. I'm doing it late at night thinking, oh, this would be a nice surprise for us. And I'm going through on my phone and then I've got it all through. And it's like, it's all changed. Sent me the, doc, uh, doc, the document over. Um, and then I just sent it to Ollie. He's out with some friends and he's like, have you seen what you've done? And I was like, no. And he's like, well, I need, look, and it's Guru. So legally for two weeks, my name was Guru Paul Lock Lock. To be fair, I think I prefer it to Gareth, if I'm honest. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, it makes sound very exotic. <laughs> doesn't it? Guru. I was the only person in the world that named Guru. Um, and then basically now on documents where it says previous names, I have to put Gareth Paul Lock, mm, like Gar- Guru Paul Lock Lock. And now Gareth, Paul, Lock, Lock. So, so yes, legally, and <laughs> by the end, names. we will be Lock, Locks. Yeah. Nice. I just have many other names now. Man of many names. I mean, it's very rare to, to meet and fall in love with someone who has the same surname as you. I know, we did have to do biology, like, biological tests. Do you remember going to, wed- the, going to get our uh, wedding certificate and they were like, are you actually, in, are, you, are you related? And we were like, no, we're not. And they were like, we have to check. <laughs> well, they didn't check very hard, did but Also, they? it should go on more than a surname, yes, surely. It should, probably. Everyone yeah. should just have blood tests if that's the case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. I mean, they're, they're like, are you sure? Yeah, we're not related. Okay, that was good enough for them, really, wasn't it? We could mm. be. Let's not do 23 and me. Yeah, just in case. <laughs> just in case. <laughs> I've done it. You don't do it. <laughs> My half-brother is living in London in Chelsea. <laughs> Ollie, great. <laughs> so what were your childhoods like? Did you grow up in Chelsea? No, I, I'm a massive fraud. Um, I grew up in Southampton. And, <laughs> well, um, that's quite a change. And actually, I'm going to be really naughty and say that the only time I've ever lived in Chelsea is the last three weeks when we moved to Chelsea. Uh, but I've lived in Fulham for the last 20 years nearly. Really? Yeah, so made in Fulham, really. It's a bit like real <laughs> cool. so I was born in London, but then we moved out when I was really young. But I was all, I've always been in London, in and out. And, and actually, I secretly, he's Nessex boy. I'm Are you? Whereabouts? I'm an Essex girl, so it's... I'm yeah. uh, 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 Dedham. But you were Colchester. born in Chelsea. Ah, Chelsea. Whereabouts are you from? Uh, Ingate Stone. Ingate. So uh, you're Chelsea. a bit too close to London, near Margareting. Yeah. Yeah, I like Ingate Stone. It's nice. Yeah, it's nice. There's a really nice good place antique place. shop there. I'm showing my age. That's a gay thing to say. That's a really <laughs> gay thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> I love antiquing. What can I say? That's fine. <laughs> what were your childhoods like? Mine was wonderful, I must admit. I was so lucky. Um... I have the most I've, I've got wonderful parents and a wonderful sister, and I, I, that was. I mean, my parents got, broke up when I was when I was very young. I was yeah. about eight, but it didn't affect me. I think I was, I was a, a young kid that went oh, two houses, two presents at Christmas, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and and that was enough for me. And I yeah. think I was on that age that I was just I was about eight, so uh, I think I was fine. But yeah, I had a wonderful childhood, really. Um, I did go to boarding school at between eight and ten. I can't remember. Oh, when, really? So I was at boarding school since from very young, so um, but I loved it. I was with my friends. It's str- there were struggles, obviously. Yeah. But um, but yeah, that was that was always quite fab. Yeah. Really. It's one of those, isn't it? Because when when your children arrive and they get to that age, you know, I wonder if you'll kind of be like, oh, that's so young, and I wonder if it's also a generational thing. Whereas, you know, I, I've got friends who went to boarding school, and now that their kids are at that age, they're like, oh, I couldn't imagine doing it. Gee, I'm with you entirely. I don't think I would want to send them after spending. The amount of money and the amount yeah. of time trying yeah. to have babies, the yeah. last thing I want to do is give them to someone else to bring up. I mean, I've read Mallory Towers and it sounds so much fun. So <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted to go. Yep. I remember yeah, showing kids and, and parents, prospective parents, around um, boarding school and stuff like that. And they were like, so how much like Hogwarts is it? <laughs> and their kids are just obsessed with Harry Potter. They want to be in Hogwarts. Yeah. Hogwarts definitely came out after you went to school. <laughs> you didn't <laughs> try and make yourself seem younger. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I never went to boarding school. Um, well, I did actually learn six, but didn't go very well. Um, but my, both my parents still together now. My mum's sadly sort of almost gone with Alzheimer's. But my parents, I grew up in a very loving family, very close. Got an older brother, 
um, had the most wonderful, I, I, like, idyllic upbringing. And yeah. my, I, my parents always wanted me around. Like, I wanted to go to boarding school. And I was like, no, you're staying like near me. We So much so that my, we always used to move. My mom moved to a company close to where the school was. So that, and my dad was a stay-at-home dad. He retired when I was very young. Really? Yeah, retired in 94, I think. So he was a stay-at-home dad. So I sort of had the flip reversal. So I had this like powerhouse mother. Yeah. So this real inspiration. So I have like this real attraction to like strong sort of uh, powerful females. Like, yeah. I, like most is that why you married me? <laughs> yeah, that is, exactly. Clearly. Thanks so much. <laughs> it's the female energy you push on. <laughs> um, so yeah, most of my friends are like, you know, females in sort of really successful sort of uh, positions who are driven and motivated. Yeah. It's something I really resonate with because that's, that's the upbringing I had. It was like a flip reversal. Yeah. Um, and I was all, always around it. My parents were very open with me um, and very like honest, open family. So sort of exposed from a lot very young in a very sort of tight nuclear unit really yeah which is fun which hopefully we're going to recreate just. and did what well, did those relationships that you had with your parents and with and with yours did they make you think ahead to you growing up and starting your own families interesting you say that because i think up until about five to ten years ago kind of thing i think that's the first time when we ever could look forward to having children because mm. of legalities, yep. um, etc. And so I always would watch my best friend's wedding or whatever like that, and I would think, well, I'll be, I'll be Rupert Everett. I'll be that fun uncle that always has dinner parties and 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 has loads of disposable income and and sits there <laughs> travelling the world. And that was what I thought my position was going to be like. I think once it became slightly more um, normalised that, that that gay guys could have children. I think I went, ah, there's a switch here. And for where my mind has always been that this wasn't going to be a possibility. Um, you had to open your mind and kind of learn in a different way that you ever thought before. Mm. And so then I go, okay, what kind of parent do I want to be? So that's the journey that I think we have been on for the last three or four years is, yeah. is trying to go through IVF and stuff and, and realising what we what we are going to be like and how we are going to be as parents. Yeah. yeah, I think that was, I was always open to being a parent. Like It's always something that I envisaged for myself, whether it was adoption or IVF, like the route we've taken. Um, you actually told me on camera, didn't you? We were yeah. filming Chelsea and he was like, I think I actually want to have kids. Because it's something I'd been like, oh, would you ever be open to it? And Ollie was like, it's it's a big thing then to have a family and you know you, you your worry shifts because you yeah. know right you're worried about your kids like now we're what we're 20 weeks 20 yeah weeks we're now? 20 weeks 20 weeks and we had to have a scan the other day and every time i'm worrying and they're, they're still in the womb like yeah what's it gonna be like when they're out and you know the first six months the first year the first two years first 20 years uh -huh. all these worries what when they get to like 16 and start going out i'm like no you're not going anywhere my daughter you're not <laughs> dating him like all of this i'm like i'm already worrying about this and it's only going to amplify and that was your big worry wasn't it that was uh, yeah the biggest worry however I, I also want to make sure more than anything you have to a lot of people any advice we could be given and especially with twins is someone turned around the other day and said you can't call them the twins because they are different people yeah they're individuals and i want to make sure that this is not my life. This is their life. And I want them to know that from very early. And they need to make the mistakes and need to make all the choices they want to make. And it's, it's absolutely nothing to do with me. I'll guide you in the best way I possibly can um, and support you in every way. But this is your little life and you need yeah. to make that what you what you will. It's such a big shift mentally as well, isn't it? That the idea of you're, you're going about, especially if you didn't think family was going to be on the table you're going about your life being that that person that's just having fun and making the most out of everything and all of a sudden there's that responsibility that's going to come in and life is going to look and feel and be very very different i think we want to yes it obviously will be completely different but i, I know that whatever platform we will go on and do i'm i always know we'll be sharing this journey with everyone yeah and there will be some sort of glitter to sparkle up with. <laughs> um, and with some humour, with some love and with some bits. Because it's it's not often you see people from the moment the babies are born to all the nights, all the situations. You are literally, you are going to be involved in our lives in a platform that we will explain another time. Right, okay. Um, Everyone's going to see a struggle. <laughs> I, think it, I think this is so funny because everyone's like, oh, you don't know what you're letting yourself in for. I was like, we've, we've just been on this three-year journey to have kids. And also no one we knows what they're know. letting themselves in. No. Know? But you know what I mean? I think, I, I, I don't think it matters what your experience is with other children before you have kids. The reality is your emotions, the tiredness, that only affects you when you are in that situation. Mm. And you learn on the job. Everyone learns on the job. No one knows what they're doing until they have a newborn in their arms. And that's absolutely fine. That's part of the 
Well, I think that's the joy, isn't it? Yeah. As well, like that's something that you have to learn. And can't wait. Hate sleep. Yeah. <laughs> well, the amount- wimp. Can't wait. That's yeah, really. I'm just going to be like this, you know. I said I, I went and had some Botox done yesterday, and I was like, I'm going to be back in in six months a lot. So it's going to be. You need to, and she's like, Okay, okay, fine. I was, she's like, You'll be fine. I was like, Well, and everyone sort of says, When you have twins, you don't know any different. Yeah. So you know. Thank God, we started with twins. So if we have a third, it'll be much easier. I can imagine lots of people around the world right now going, mm, yeah, you wait. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you two meet and when did you first start talking about the future and families? So we met, would you believe, should we show our age slightly, in China White's nightclub. Wow. Holly's older Throwback. than me. FYI. Holly's <laughs> older than me. That is. Do you remember when that was? It was 2000 and November 2009. November 2009 on Air Street when you pulled up in Freelander with long hair and probably some of the Union Jack on it, fluttering around with almost way too much fake tan on. That sounds about right. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that would have been it. And we were both involved in a fashion show of a friend of ours, Jade Holland Cooper, who has a, a brand called um, Holland Cooper. And she's, uh, she's married to the owner of Super Dry. So there's right. this fabulous powerhouse mm-hmm. down in the, in the Cotswolds mm. who are great friends of ours. Now, they always have this fabulous um, Cheltenham Gold Cup weekend where they invite lots of famous, wonderful people around them. But we've known them for so long. I was her first ever employee, went to university with her. Gareth was managing director of the company. And we all went down, and it was a Saturday afternoon after the racing, and there was no alcohol involved whatsoever. And I remember sitting, it was snowing outside. And I remember sitting by the fire, talking in their fabulous kitchen. And uh, and I remember about half an hour into it, it went better and better. And I was like, I, I knew this guy for such a long time, but I'd never noticed who was standing in front of me. Suddenly the dog had terrible diarrhea, oh my God. if I remember. <laughs> and for some reason you got out of your, you got that and, and cleaned it all up, it, which I found hilarious. Yeah, because this dog was basically a horse. And this room was enormous, but the smell was quickly filling the room. So and great. Ollie was enjoying sitting by the fire so much. I was like, I'm going to be the hero here and I'm going to save his fireside seat. So this is a fast forward from the China White's night. <laughs> Absolutely this, right. This is After ten, years, ten years of years. Uh, years of friendship and, and kind of... I thought you were nine years on. Really, I thought I, I thought you were up here in arse. Um, <laughs> so and, and, I, and at the time, I was right. Um, <laughs> and it was nine years on. Ollie had been through it all, up and down the ego. And um, <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. He's a very sweet, empathetic boy. But a yes. little bit egotistical. At the time. Anyway, many years later, we were in front of that thing, and I went, "Oh God!" I was like, after all the ups and downs, I, I'm going to marry him. And that was that was literally that day, and we got engaged seven months later. Isn't it crazy to think that you knew of each other, were in each other's lives for so long, and then that shift just happens, like a like a light switch almost kind of goes, oh, actually, this is something different. Absolutely mm. right. It's like one of those funny things, because my friend, I said, my friend Jade, she introduced us, and she had the total of two gay friends. And then she was like, oh, you two should be together. And I was like... <sighs> Everyone says this. It doesn't work like this. Like this, you, just because they're gay. Yeah, just <laughs> typical hetero. Uh, yeah. Anyway, um, and then yeah, she was right. It did it worked? I literally and I moved into your house for like within three weeks. And like, yeah, I'm literally like a cuckoo straight. You in. never left. Everything. Everyone else out the nest. Me in. And that's been five years now. <laughs> it has been. Yeah, we were at Cheltenham actually back in March, and it was five year anniversary. Yeah, it was. No. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it was. Yeah, I must admit, it's been it's been a very interesting five years. Um, it's been an amazing five years. We've we've learned a lot. We've grown a lot together. You said about wanting a family on on camera, mm. but had you had that conversation at all beforehand to make you think that maybe you wouldn't? And we we hadn't. Ollie to to that point was just basically saying that it was something that he wouldn't want because he wouldn't want the heartache of it. And yeah. just this, you know, it was. I think what what happened was. A lot of people around us started having kids, yeah. and you you're living in this life, this stage in your life, and then suddenly everyone else starts moving on, and you see what that is for real, yeah. and you're a bit like what you've made up in your head, where you're like, kids, it's a, a, a tremendous sort of responsibility. There's this worry. There's this, you know, you've got to give your entire life over to them, and then suddenly all your friends move on. You get that bit older, you get to your thirties, or whatever, and then you're suddenly like, hang on a minute, I want this for myself because yeah. it's you, it's not that you get bored of things, but it's kind of like what more is there to life? And then I think it's such a fundamental thing to be able to have a kid and raise a kid. And if it's important to you and if it's something you want to do, I think you just, you suddenly switch and then you're like, I want this for me. And I think that's what happened. So I'm godfather to Binky Felstead's first daughter, India. And I remember the first time I brought you over to meet India and we knew Binky a bit before. Hmm. And um, I watched you playing with India. And I remember sitting there being like, I, I, I just can't imagine you not being a father, yeah. but you have to be. This is something that is it's ingrained in your body that you are that good with children. 
and then I had that whole switch in my mind to go, oh my goodness, this is something that actually we could do. We're allowed to do it. We can do it. Let's try and start on the adventure. And oh, what an adventure it's been to try and yeah. get there. But it's, it's uh, yeah, that was, that was the, uh, the, the first day I remember being like, oh my goodness, I think we are going to try and be fathers because you have to be one. That was very sweet. I think you've said that to me before. But yeah, I love, I do love kids. I was just down. I've actually just been made godparent to my friend Jay. He's got a lot of hair time. I made a godfather to her son, Jamie. And um, like, I hadn't spent that much time because obviously COVID and stuff, she had a mm. baby. And this kid's going to be a big part of my life. So I'd be down every morning, like at eight, doing like stickers in the book, <laughs> going through it. And it's just like, right, new page, new page. And then just sort of playing around and things like that. And it's just, you know, the. I, th- I think I, I when I was about 28, I got to the point where I was like, God, I'd really love to have kids. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, just being around, especially close friends, and then you see them with their kids. Or like my brother, he's had a daughter and a son. And then you see them, and these kids that are incredibly close to you, it's something that you just have to give a lot of, a lot of love over to. Yeah. Because it's really enjoyable. And it's something that, yeah, from a young age, I've sort of been like, I want this, but if I don't have this because I'm, you know, I'm gay and my partner might not want them, or you know, it might be difficult, like it has been for us with IVF, we might not be able to afford it. Um, it's something that I want to enjoy, you know, through other people's kids that are close to me. Yeah. So when you had both decided that that's what you wanted in your future, what was the next step? How did you decide that IVF was the route for you? Goodness me, where to start this? God, it's a massive education. There's so many pitfalls, and just it's such a grey area, isn't it? Trying to find the information of where to go with surrogacy is a minefield. Especially in the UK. Especially oh, in the UK. Um, they haven't changed the laws in 35 years. And it's a, almost like the government sit there and go, oh, you can get married, you can do that, but we're going to make it as hard as you possibly can to have children. Um, and so anyway, the difficulties behind that are, are wild. Um, but one of the big laws in the UK is that you're not allowed to see the face of the egg donor. Right. Um, at all. And so we are our babies that are growing right now. We haven't seen the face. We just have a couple of, we know the eye color, hair color, mm-hmm. um, complexion. That's basically it. Um, we decided we wanted to go against that slightly and go to America to try and do it because then we can see, we can actually meet them if we want to do. We eat, meet the egg donor and find out who they are. And yet we couldn't get in because it was COVID. Yeah. And so we did it in Mexico. We right. had a Brazilian egg donor that came up to Mexico to to give her eggs and and that was all all great. And then through an egg donor agency in LA, wasn't it? Yeah, and we were very lucky. Yeah, that we um, had been on the show and a a few lovely angel women had contacted us saying they'd love to help us on their journey, on our journey to to become parents. And so we met a few and we found this lovely, lovely, lovely lady down in the West Country. And she came out to Mexico with us, and it was just heaven. And it was just a one. We spent six weeks out there. Seven. We spent seven weeks, seven weeks in Mexico. <laughs> and I was like, Oof. and so we, we came home, and and we were all all excited, and hopefully that was that was the situation. We we put two eggs in as well, and um, and it didn't work. There was a bit of naivety to it, wasn't there? Because basically, yeah, I think we're open enough to say that as well. Oh, it was naivety. We so we went down the route. And we went to the best doctors. We had an amazing friend, Sophie Beresina. She had this amazing doctor in Harley Street. So we started with him. Then we go to the best clinics. You go to the best egg donors. All of this, all everything checks out perfectly. And you think it's just literally this sort of additional thing. And and, and I've got to say, I think there is that whole thing of let's chuck money on it and it yeah. will all fall into place and it will be absolutely fine. And actually what you've experienced is it's, it's not, not the like case. Getting, getting pregnant, even if it's natural, it's IVF, it's whatever, it's not the easiest thing. Yeah. It's biology. Yeah. And sometimes there's, it could be many different things that you don't know what's going on with the body. You don't know if the egg donors are a match for us. You don't know whatever. And these things are simply like you... It isn't a, you know, you go to the best and it happens. It is, it's a process. Yeah. And it doesn't happen immediately for people yeah. a lot of the time. And it's, you know, it, it is a journey. And actually at the time, and I'll be honest with you, the we we were share, sharing it all because we don't know any different. We put, like, the thing to make reality TV and all our lives and what the work we do respectful is you give everything over. Yeah. Like, we talk about the IVF. I talk, we talk about being gay. We talk about, I talk about my mom's al- Alzheimer's illness because you represent people for stuff they don't normally want to talk about. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what makes it respectful for me. Yeah. So we're like, right, we'll share everything. We'll, the, you're making the embryos, do all of this. And people are saying to us, please do not make this look so easy. Like, it doesn't happen like this. Like... Like for us, it didn't happen th- third, fourth, fifth time, whatever. Then we found out live on a Chelsea scene that it hadn't worked, 
and it was so crushing and so monumentally upsetting. And for me, it was because Ollie was so upset, and I just go into protective mode with him, and I just want him to be okay. Mm. But it is one of those things it. that you choose, because I always said when we started the journey, I said, I promise you, I will share every moment of this journey with you, because this is something that that I've done for an awfully long time. And I said to the to the camera crew, I said, this, we don't know what this is going to be like. The phone call is going to come through. We genuinely don't know if this is yeah. going to be uh, we're pregnant or we're not. Either way, there's going to be tears. That's but I said, whatever happens, keep the cameras rolling. And that's, we did. And that's what we did. And, and, it, was, and, and it was a no, unfortunately. I'm, I'm sorry that there's, there's nothing there. And this was after an awful lot of money, six, six weeks and seven weeks from Mexico. And it's been about six months that we've been on this journey, hasn't it? At that six time, months. yeah. And then suddenly after that, it was kind of like, right, what are the positives here? We've got to keep going, whatever. And then everyone's like, thank you now for sharing this. Because exactly. We and and also, you can't, you can't share that journey without sharing those initial bits of the hope. I think anyone, yeah. when they're going on, on, you know, on a pregnancy journey, they, they, they have, you have that hope of what's life going to be like. You have all those dreams. So you have to have all that lightness and all of that in there. Yeah. Because... That is, that is the reality. And then actually when it doesn't, you know, you have to have that in, in place, I believe, to see how crushing it is yeah. when it doesn't happen. Well, it's, 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 it's like the journey, isn't it? People have been on it. There's all this positivity and then suddenly there's this thing. And now, yeah. you know, we've got that new equilibrium <laughs> so yeah, storytelling, yeah, yeah. isn't it? Exactly. Um, and it, it, everyone's part of the journey. And what makes, it, what makes it true and realistic is the fact that we've shared it all the way along. Yeah. And, you know, and now hopefully we've been able to help create a conversation around IVF and people who have struggled with it and been on a similar journey to us or, you know, are still on the same journey um, feel represented and feel like, you know, they, they can get some resonance in, in what we've done. Yeah. And I think it doesn't matter. You know how you were saying, you know, that that part of your journey was six months. And for some people it'd be like, oh, it was only six months. But that's six months when you're in it. Mm. is agonizing and ah, long that was just the beginning yeah, yeah. exactly i know <laughs> been, i know and then years. but even then you know you can't but talking about that point you're like well that was a long chunk of time but then actually everything that's come after it as well so from that 6 month part point when you've you know you've ended that first part of trying what was the next move it was another 5 months and then we went again didn't we well that was a difficult did you one, take a breather um, I think we took, uh, again, we left that to, to the surrogate. We wanted to see what, what, how her body was. We wanted to make sure she was in the right mental position to do so. Yeah. Um, and so... And then we still had COVID going on. So well, that was that the issue. Everything down, wasn't it? So then we were like, let's go back to Mexico. And we were about to book our flights. And then that went into the red list. Oh, God. And so we're like, what do we do? We've got all the embryos in Mexico. So we had to fly them from Mexico to Cyprus. We couldn't bring them to the UK because we had seen the face of the embryo. Right. The egg donor. Right. So that was not a legal situation we could do. So we had to go to Cyprus. And so they landed there and uh, we went a- another round. And with absolute joy, at eight o'clock in the morning, we got a phone call from her in the room next door saying, come over. And oh. she was like, I'm pregnant. And we were like, this is just the best thing we've ever heard. It about. was, uh, so basically, the difficulty is with IVF, you know when the egg goes in. Yeah. So it's not like, you know, if you, you get pregnant naturally and you five weeks and then suddenly do a pregnancy test and then you're close to the six weeks yeah. we are from dot uh-huh. so there's so many hurdles and so mm-hmm. so much that can go wrong in the time being and then we've done the transfer and how many days is it six mm. six six days you have to wait um and we then the night before <laughs> i don't think we did <clears throat> um the night before um we we're going to do a test and um, we're going we we're like going to bed and i was like i bet she's tested tonight and i bet it's not positive although she'd tell us and you all these things going through your head so i i don't sleep at all and the next morning we obviously get this call go into the room and she is pregnant is this the, fir- the have you had the same surrogate the whole the way same through? surrogate this was the, the same surrogate, the same surrogate, surrogate. surrogate right yeah. however six weeks later after that six weeks two days um sadly we miscarried that and so they Again, one of those moments in life where you it was terribly upsetting. I think you start to become a bit numb, didn't that you? That was our six I remember it was our six week scan. We had gone down to the West Country and we walked in and we were all smiling and laughing and having a wonderful time. And uh, there were no heartbeats. And we sat there and went, Okay, don't really know what to do now. So we went for lunch and it was just it was just a horrible, horrible, horrible day. There is just, you know... And that's when we did take a bit of a break. Yeah. There is, there's getting pregnant and then there's, you know, having a successful pregnancy, a healthy pregnancy mm-hmm. and all of this. And it's kind of like, what what makes this thing work, you know? It's, and as I said before, it's biology. It's like components coming together that even doctors won't think about. Mm-hmm. And you, you just have to leave it, you know, up to fate at that stage. And you just have to... Heart, it's, it's easy to say now, have a thick skin about it. I've been through the emotional roller coaster yeah. of it, and it is like an entire grieving process. Yeah. Um, and I mean, before the last time we did it, 
I just, I, there was a, there was a sort of pit in me. It was just like, is this ever going to happen for us? And, you know, the second time we had a miscarriage, then we had a bit of a break. And then the third time, and then obviously the fourth time we have been successful. And that's why I'm like, I'm 10 to hooks the inside. Yeah. I mean, I'm, like, I'm like 20 weeks and I'm like, it's less than 1% chance that you could miscarry at this stage. But, you know, every scan I'm like, oh God, oh God, oh God, what's what's going to what's gonna go? I, I think, so I had a miscarriage, my first pregnancy had a miscarriage. And I think what that does is it takes away the innocence that you might have going into a pregnancy because it is that every day, every toilet trip, you're just waiting. Yeah. You're waiting for something to go wrong. And even, you know, I can remember the 23 mark for me being like the... We're, we're so close now, you know, mm. we're, we're, we're viable. Um, but I don't think it, and that's all three pregnancies, you know, following, following that, I, I think it stayed with me right until the end. Yeah. I think it is that it, it, it robs you of, of, of looking at it in an innocent way. But it, it really, I'm, it's, it's a horrible feeling, but God, there is nothing more ratifying that you want to be a parent more than that. Yeah. It's like, it, it's this sense of worry about loss of something that already, I mean, I'm obsessed with my dogs. God know what I'm going to be like with my kids. And yes, it, we've always said that. <laughs> and they say it's a hundred and cry. And that was something that I wasn't expecting because I am a crier. And... I think I had cried so much the first time, I think I was just in kind of numbed, some numbed abyss for a, a year or so, where I was, yeah, going out, having some drinks, having a lovely time, and, and basically living a, a, a life that was a little bit numb. And, and that's the truth. Mm -hmm. I think I was doing everything I possibly could. You were existing, but you weren't feeling the emotions you often do because you are numb to it. Yeah. And because all you know, at that point... All you want is those babies. And it's it takes such a long time to try and get there. And I, I think, yes, I think you're, I, that's exactly what it was. I was living a, a half-life. It was, I must say, for the three year, three and a bit years we've been trying to do this, the, the first time you don't get it and suddenly you've got this expectation about how your life's going to play out, yeah. it does feel like everything's on pause. Yeah, Like it was a stasis. And then when we're now at this final stage, it finally feels like, Actually, our lives can go forward a bit more. Yeah, it's a bit like when Hugh Grant has the seasons going past when he's trying to get over Julia Roberts in Notting Hill, <laughs> and suddenly the seasons go past and everyone's getting on with their business and stuff like that, and and suddenly at the end, Hugh's the same person, but mm. seasons have gone on. It felt like that, I think, for us. I, I think uh, grief when it comes to to a loss um, and and miscarriage. I know that for for Tom, uh, my husband, um, he only processed the miscarriage once. Buzz had arrived. So it, it kind of that Interesting. almost it was that this is what, literally holding our baby in his arms and going, this is actually what we lost, you know, you know, and, and even though you've got a baby that you're that's that's so long for and loved, it, it kind of just makes sense of, of what that was, I think, because it was happening to my body. So it, for him, it felt, you know, I have to make sure that she's OK. And and actually it just it made sense afterwards, I think. Yeah, I think when you take stock of it, and I yeah, appreciate that, you've got the baby. Yeah. And it's kind of like right now, you've got that sort of fulfillment. It's kind of like, let's actually look at this and yeah. assess it, which is actually a really lovely way to think about it because yeah. it just shows so much caring. Yeah. And My sister always says that she, she, she had a miscarriage in between her first and second child, and she always looks at her, her baby now and goes, I know that's the baby that was meant to be there. Yeah. Like she, like that's absolutely, she feels that it's got the soul of, of what that baby was going to be. Yeah. It's just the outside wasn't right. Yeah. That's that's a gorgeous way of looking at it. Mm. So after the miscarriage, you then went again. Yes. Um, Was there had, a change in the situation at that point? Yeah. Well, we had um, some advice from doctors um, saying that maybe um, maybe the, the surrogate and your sperm and the egg weren't working as well. So we so we um, started having a quick look and, and speaking to people about other surrogate situations. Yeah. And, um, Which must be really difficult as well to end a journey with a surrogate when you've already been on such a, you know, and you know, a, a big emotional journey together. I mean, yeah. yeah, and it's 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 you know, we kind of what is right, what's the right thing to do, and what's the fair thing to do. Cause yeah. You can't just keep going through the same situation. Um, and it's something we took about a year, year eight months. Yeah, it's quite a while to go through it. Um, and, and also, it's hard on right all thing. of you, right? It's hard on you. You. It's it's hard on on the surrogate. So it's a it's a big thing for all of you. Yeah, where well, you've got this person who wants to do this amazing thing and wants yeah. to be a surrogate for someone. It's the first time she was a surrogate for a couple. So and she was family. She is family. Yeah, yeah. she always will be in our lives. I yeah. hope. Um, and then this other lady came about and said, "We'd like to help," and 
again, we, we went through that. That was last year. We went through a first round with her and we got, we were in Bali filming and we got a, a positive test. And we were so excited. There's new eggs and new sperm, everything. It was, it was fabulous. <clears throat> and, um, and we got a yeah, positive pregnancy test. And then throughout the week, it just went, went less and less and less. And then it was just gone. So we went, okay, let's, let's see what we can do again. And so we waited for a couple of weeks, a, couple, a month or so. And we were quite quick after that because... And we didn't tell I, anyone. Really? We thought, but this time, we're not going to tell anyone. Our parents weren't telling anyone about it. Did you just want to remove everyone else's expectation? It was kind of like, I think we'd shared everything to that point. And then I was kind of a bit like, I was in Bali, so I got a bit woo-woo and basically started wearing evil eyes. <laughs> and being like, no, I don't want anyone's negative opinions on this and maybe that's affecting it. But um, I was just like, look, this is, let's not have the stress. We weren't filming at that time. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that would have been shared anyway. Um, and we're like, actually, the tracks here that we would just go and do this, take the pressure off the surrogate to do this. It's even like, even telling our family, and it's been like, is it happening? Is it happening? Is it happening? Or even Oliver's mother wanted to come up um, when it was the first, which scan? 12-week 12, 12 yeah. scan. We hadn't, and we hadn't told everyone until six weeks. 12-week scan. And I was a bit like, just in case anything's wrong, yeah. let's just not, because let's just have it through as what it has to be. Um, but yeah, it was... But we um, did it just, we did it before Christmas, and yeah, we kept silent about it, and we just waited and waited and waited, and then we were skiing, and we got a we got a pretty wonderful phone call. Oh, that was wait, what scan was that? Six, six weeks scan. So, how did you feel finding out that you that there was a positive pregnancy to start with after following all the losses? When we got the positive pregnancy test in Bali, and we were all excited, when we decided not to tell anyone the next round we were going, there was a in my eyes especially, and I did say this on the show, but I felt this inordinate uh, embarrassment and shame and I felt like it was I was mortified and every I didn't want to tell my father that was one thing I'd I don't mind about telling mum but my dad I felt demasculated I felt emasculated um I felt um like I wasn't the man I should be and I know that sounds really silly mm. but it's something that like it's like why can't I have a child why I'm trying so hard is it my sperm what, what's wrong with it like why can't why can't we get there it's all of our sperms I don't know what's happening and, uh, and I think that was something that, that broke my heart slightly. That, so I, at that point, I think we said, let's not tell anyone. I was, it was, I was fully on the woo-woo track, just not, not having the evil eyes <laughs> on me. For me, it was embarrassing. <laughs> and also, when, when our parents find out, whatever like that, suddenly uh, the papers find out, whatever like that, and suddenly you've got Google alerts saying yeah, yeah, that, yeah. oh, devastated, it hasn't happened again and stuff. And you go, oh, God, I just really don't want this again. The parents find out in the papers. Do you think your mother's the leak? <laughs> um, and it was just, uh, just heartbreaking. Anyway, then we did get that fabulous phone call saying that things had gone right. Was there a hesitation to enjoy it, or were uh, you well, able absolutely, to? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it, even even till we got to the week twelve, I was on a stasis of being like, you're, you're almost in denial. Like mm. six, we hadn't got to six weeks. We got to six weeks, two days. We had a scan at seven weeks the second time we got pregnant. So we'd miscarried. There was just sack left and then was miscarried. This um, time, I think we've had a scan every week since. Oh, God, literally this is... I, I don't know whether this is just because my anxiety would be through the roof. But anyway, we get to six weeks, there's twins, right? And we'll tell you the story of how that all came out in a minute. And then we got to nine weeks and our, our surrogate had a fall. So right. she's gone in for a scan, and I'm like, "Well, we're done for." And this is, I'm like, I'm the unluckiest person in the world. This is mate, all perfect. Week ten had to have a harmony test, so another scan. Yeah. Week eleven, another scan for some reason. Week twelve, the twelve week scan, all of this. So it was kind of like, right, okay, great. I'm this. I'm getting to about day five in the week. Two two nights of anxiety, mm -hmm. then we've got a scan. Brilliant, and then back front, and so I'm on this like journey. Otherwise, if it was like four weeks by each time, I'd probably be pulling my hair out by week two. <laughs> But yes, we've had scans almost every week now, which has been heavenly in lots of ways because it's been, you, you get to see the babies are absolutely fine and they are doing really well. Uh, and at that point, we did find out it was a boy and a girl and we did find that live on camera. So well, well, let's, let's rewind, rewind, rewind to the moment that you found out you were having twins. Because was that did that even enter your mind at any point on this journey? We know it happens, yeah. but you know it's it's a, a, an egg split situation. It's not a, you know it's not two embryos put in. Well, this was actually two embryos put oh, in. Oh, oh, 
Yeah. So this is different. It's because obviously this is our fourth our fourth time. Yeah. And we we're, we're with the London Women's Clinic and they and she basically said, look, there's no there's no way about it. We have to put two in. Really? They were like, I think you need to do this. This is advice being like, I think you need to do this now. It's your fourth round. It's been three years. Like we are we are going to do this now. Wow. Which is very rare in England. They don't do that very often. Yeah. I think it's just because it's been, you know, the fourth time. I think even, even by the second time they start suggesting it, but it wasn't until the fourth time. That they were like, we're doing. Of course, I'm, I'm, my mind's gone funny. Of course, then they're, they're, they're a boy and a girl. They're yeah, no identical. Right. Yeah. Too, yeah, yeah, yeah. But also, yeah, to have a boy and a girl is a is a. We sat there, we're like, oh my god, twins. That they've actually both worked for the yeah. first time. Like it's also, it's not that it's not a hundred percent going to happen with one embryo, let alone two. So did you find out it was twins at a scan? Well, what were we doing? You can tell this. <laughs> we were skiing. Of course, and uh, <laughs> I'm terribly responsible. We? we weren't at the scan at all. Uh, so we had gone away uh, before starting the new series to have a bit of a chill, and we were. Gareth decided we knew it was going to happen that morning. That scan, I my I'm unbearable anxiety. Oh, I'm highly strong, so I basically was like, right, I can't just sit at home and not concentrate. So I was like, I'm going off my own, and just went skiing hard. I covered about ten miles in the morning. I had managed to down a bottle of red wine the night before or two to try and numb that so I could wake up a little bit later so it was close to the midday scan mark. Right. Ollie woke up and I wasn't there. He went ballistic at me. I was like, where are you? He was like, skiing. And I was like, oh, I was like no, what? Anyway, so I was on the I way there. Just and sit there. I knew this phone call was going to come and I had this lovely Irish guy to my left who was driving us in, um, in a big van and a guy in the back that I'd never met before <laughs> who was English. And uh, the phone rang. I said, guys, I'm so sorry. Just let you know, I'm, there's going to be tears either way here. I was like, don't think I'm mad. I'm just finding out whether we've got children or not. It's just a small thing in life. <laughs> and so I sat there, put it on. And I've got the video because I recorded it. And she basically sat there and was like, there's two. And I was like, oh, my God. I was like, I turned it And the Irish guy next to me who had never met from the guy, they both kind of hugged me. And I was like, thank you so much, random strangers. You're so kind. You know this before my family or my husband. Or me, yeah. Um, <laughs> Because I'm, I, I know also, typically, I'm being a bit of an idiot, and basically, we're an hour ahead in France. So yeah. I'm like, oh, it's 11 o'clock, the scan's meant to be happening. And I'm like panicking, half an hour's gone past, wrong Ollie. It's like, we're an hour ahead, calm down. <laughs> and then she got there, and then she needed a, like, a bladder full of um, um, pee. Wee. Yeah. Pee. I was going to say water, it's not, it's pee. Um, and then, um, so then that took a bit longer. So then it wasn't until about one o'clock that we found out, and we went to find out at 11. Right. So one o'clock UK time, just in case you're wondering. Um, and then, yeah, so by this point, I'm, I've drunk a beer because I'm, I'm just worrying. I'm with my, one of my friends from the show. And then I'm on a chairlift and Ollie's found out. And then my phone's just vibrating in the pocket. How many times? I reckon six times I called yeah. you. At least, no! And you would not pick up. It, and I was like, I need to I, tell someone apart from this random, lovely Irish guy to my I would have dropped left. my phone and then you wouldn't have been able to tell me at all. <laughs> See, well, you just sat there going, oh my God, it's ringing, but I can't well, pick it up. I sort of knew by the fact he rang me once. And I was like, right, if it's one ring, and I'm just playing out this entire thing in my head. If it's one ring, it's not worked. And then the second one came, then the third, then the fourth. And I was like, okay, this, he's excited now. Yeah. So I get to the top and then I'm like speaking to him. And then Ollie's basically just blubbering down the phone to me, <laughs> as he would, bless. And he's like, we're pregnant. I was like, right, okay. And then and then with the baby, and I was like, right, okay. And then in my head, I was like, right, okay, it's one, fine, we, that's fine. And I'd sort of thought in my head and made up this entire thing where I was getting these two boys and all of this. Yeah, you sounded quite disappointed when I said we're pregnant. You were like, oh. Yeah, because I thought you just said it was one. And then, and I, was like, and then no. I was like, hang on, it could have been two. And in my head, I'm like, I can't. I want, I'm going to have a second child because I, I, I grew up with a brother, you grew up with a sister. We didn't want just an only child. So I was like, no, it's two. And then, it's two. And, and you're like, what? Like, and then that's when I was, like, I was like shaking. I think I actually dropped my phone. I'm basically dyspraxic at this point on the, on the slit, just dropping things. Um, and then a very bougie way I said, I'll meet you with a folly douche in about yeah. 10 minutes. <laughs> and then I'm, I'm like, and then I'm fr with my friend Emily, and then I've told her, and then she's crying, and then I'm crying, and then I put goggles on, and then they're steaming up, and I can't see my way down. It's a bit cloudy. I'm like, God, I'm not actually going to make it to the restaurant. <laughs> so we love the idea of our lives being rom coms, and it does feel like that sometimes when you're <laughs> walking down embankment crying on Maiden Chelsea. But um, that's how we've tried to live it. And it was, we saw each other for the first time in folly douche, all dressed in our thing. There was champagne on the table, already waiting. <laughs> and we sat there, and we were like we're pregnant and everyone was around us and it was oh, just the most gorgeous thing it's quite funny because everyone's reaction is so genuine because we we're like the fathers to the group that we're in especially mm -hmm. we're away filming with the, some of the Chelsea dot and everyone sort of comes to us for advice we, we're not in the drama we're just kind of like you know wise old owls yeah <laughs> everyone comes it's to. a nice position to be with. yeah it is it help. Yeah, yeah brilliant not making up and breaking up thank god <laughs> um and so we've just got this sort of bond with everyone and then i think just everyone everyone 
it's sort of behind us in terms of they're still getting into their relationships, not having kids, and everyone's sort of putting all this energy onto us. And it, everyone is so genuinely excited for us. So we got to that restaurant, and it was just amazing. I think I cried for five hours. Um, and then we're ringing everyone, we've rung the surrogate, and then we, at this stage, we're telling everyone we're pregnant because a lot of people don't know. Right. Um, I don't think they did at all, did they? My family didn't know. No, no. You probably told yours because you're. Oh, and did you tell everyone it was twins to start with? Yes, I think so. I think we said there was a possibility of twins. So, so you know, we like putting pressure on ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we did say that. And and now, as we're saying, it's it's twenty weeks now. Twenty, yeah, twenty weeks. And um, there's a boy and a girl, and they're both incredibly happy. And what we can't wait, well, maybe in the world, is to just welcome them to this wild adventure of what their lives will be. Yeah. And they are already so unbelievably loved, not just by us. And what's amazing is having gone through this journey. We're very lucky that we have been on this this show that I thought was going to last for six months and have now been on for 13 years. When we put our wedding on camera, we got married on the 4th of November 2020 in the Natural History Museum under the way. Beautiful, by the way. Absolutely Thanks. beautiful. And it was watched by three and a half million people, which is... It, we beat Strictly that night. <laughs> which is just the most... The most ex- for an E4 show is just extraordinary. Yeah. And it's the highest ever watched episode of Chelsea by, by about six times. <laughs> and it was so fabulous, but so many people, I think, were so invested in our journey mm. that walking out of this studio right now, I guarantee you, by getting to the car, someone will say congratulations. Mm. And they're loved by all of those people as well, all of the fabulous people that have invested in our world and, and the people that have actually kept us going an awful lot when you're in the Sainsbury's queue or whatever like that and you're you've feeling a bit of a crappy day and someone taps you on the shoulder being like, you'll get there, darling. And you go, well, that's what... Has that also added an element of pressure, though? Because you know so many people are waiting for that good news. The, when, when we had the third... When, we, when it didn't work the third time, I just had this thing being like, is it ever going to work? And then what does that mean? And, and is it just... Because we had that sort of like... Our, we'll, we're at the gate, we're waiting to go, but you couldn't go. Yeah. And it's kind of like, then what happens to our life if we never achieve this? Does it yeah. does it affect us for the rest of our life? And, you know, everyone knows that we're trying to do this. And it's, it would have had a really sad, sad note if we never got there, you know, and never had the opportunity to have kids. So the pressure coming from that just being like, what, what does that make of this if mm. it doesn't happen? Yeah. And I, I feel like there's also that whole thing of, you know, don't tell anyone you're pregnant until 12 weeks because, you know, you never know. But actually, that shuts off such a large part of your life that's really scary. Isolating. And actually, and isolating. It's, you know, I think a miscarriage is the biggest and most isolating grief you can ever go through, especially because of that whole old thing, I think. It's, I think it's a very old thing of, of, of just keeping it to yourself, not, you know, not sharing it. And actually, I think the more those conversations are shared and, and had, the better. Because it means that when you are in it, you're not feeling embarrassed. You're not feeling like you've like I felt like I'd completely and utterly failed in my first attempt of being a mum, you know. Mm. And I think the the more you have those conversations, it alleviates that for other people, or it helps. I think have those conversations that maybe other people can't have, you know, maybe because they can't find the words, or you know, the people around them aren't in you know that space that they can they can have those conversations. So I I, I you know I I highly commend you really for for sharing the, the your journey in the way that you have mm. i think we had some practice before by breakups and and love and romance and all that for all those years kind of thing and i think i think putting things on camera seemed it would be a disservice it would be something it'd be it'd be yeah it'd be a disservice to us in doing what we do as i said before what makes what we do respectable is you put it all out there you put yeah. it all on the line and you, you it's no holds barred because if, if you start to reserve stuff and you start to curate it yeah it's dishonest yeah and that's and that's not true to life yeah and as we're saying like the fact that you wouldn't say that you're having a kid before 12 weeks and if you go through a miscarriage and on your own. Yeah. Like we talk about mental health these days. Like people process things in different ways. And some people need to talk about stuff. Mm-hmm. Some people might internalize it. Yeah. Fine, it's up to them. But the fact that you're able to be like, this is life. This is what happens. And this is the emotion we're going through. Yeah. And you give it all over completely raw. That's, it's the only way I would find doing this respectable. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, did you find that you uh, you were having a boy and a girl straight away? At that 12 week? No, we found out on camera. Again. Oh, did you? <laughs> yeah, found that's out. fine. That's fine. That's yes. the lives we're living. Yeah. It's kind of what, yeah, weirdly it's, what we um, do. We went for a scan uh, with the surrogate and um, the it was a 3D scan 
um, and the our production found out then what it was. It was in an envelope. Right. And I, for the entire thing, I was like, I want two boys. I grew up with a brother. I was like, I want my rugby players. I want this. I, <laughs> I, my brother's a special rugby player. I was made to play rugby. I hated it. But for some reason, I want to repeat the <laughs> trauma. I'm not children. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to repeat the trauma. Um, so, yeah. So, basically... Um, I, but then the week before we'd found out, in my mind, I was like, hang on a minute. If I don't have a girl, what? I'm, I'm not going to have that because in my head at this point, I'm not having a third child. We'll probably have another five, but <laughs> we're not having a third child. Um, so I was like, and then I started thinking, I just want to have that experience. And then I was a bit like, oh, God, no. I, I sort of like then started romanticizing about having a girl mm. and then the boy and then growing up together and then it not being these two little twins boys because we're a household of boys. We've got two boy dolls. We're obviously both men, um, and thing. And it was kind of just like, let's just chuck in this random element of a girl and then it'd just be amazing. Yeah. And then how do we find out? We found out we were filming somewhere off Girl Street, weren't we? Yeah, we were filming and then uh, and then the star- our surrogate walked in and said, there's an envelope for you. And it said, Gareth, which one do you want? Me baby A and Baby B. I snatched Baby A. It. it was a girl. <laughs> And, no, uh, I had a boy. Sorry, yeah, you opened, yeah, you. I so I'm so you had we unfold this piece of paper. You couldn't look through. It. I, I've got the two envelopes. I hold them the light, trying to see beforehand, but couldn't. <laughs> I opened up this thing, and I was like, "It's a boy," and I was like, "It, it's two boys. It's two boys." And I looked to Wolves, and he's like being really coy, and I was like, "Hang on a minute." I was like, "We're having a boy, and a girl." And oh. I was like, "This is. We haven't even seen this yet. We haven't. That's not out on Chelsea really? yet. So no. We haven't seen it." But um, again, quite a monumental moment. We found out yeah. we're having a girl. That is a in life. That is a big moment. Yeah. Right. And um, we'd we'd always talked about two boys, hadn't we? Throughout the entire thing. Yeah, absolutely right. We've always thought it'd be two boys. We had our both boys' names. We'd absolutely. So how was that finding out about a girl? Because I think there is. Um, that gender is such a massive thing. And I think so often in pregnancy, so my uh, sister-in-law is pregnant at the moment, and literally everyone's like, it's this, it's this. You don't know, <laughs> it's 50-50. You know, but, but I think because it's now in her head, she's having one thing. You know, you, you understand when people feel oh, like slightly taken aback by a different gender, yeah. you know. Every psychic could told me two boys as well, just saying. It's <laughs> me being we were back from Bali. <laughs> Every third said, eye. Three, three, three <laughs> said it was going to be two boys. Wrong. Well, unless the scan's slightly wrong, we've just got one with a really, really small willy. Maybe. It could well be like... <laughs> I think it's not, it's not just it's, based yeah. off genitalia. <laughs> There's other it's stuff. More scientific. There's more yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, Who knows? Who knows? But Someone's I, got to have my genes. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, um, but it's it's quite fun because it's just this chaotic. We don't have any feminine energy in the house really at the moment, so it's going to just really like throw that in. No, I think yeah. we definitely need some more because we're such lads, such lads, so masculine, <laughs> lads, lads, lads. But, yeah, <laughs> we. Um, but yes, they, nuts, but right? again, now we've gone and Gareth's worked in fashion for a hundred million years, and we have been going around doing some shopping, and oh, that wow. has become an addiction. Oh, I love oh no! That has become a real, real trouble. Have you have you got a lot of things already? I've, Are you sorted? Have you already got like the nursery and stuff sorted out? We've had so reserved? much stuff turn up, really? and I have no idea what it is. Huh? What is a fluffy <laughs> foot warmer? I don't know what that is. What there is was, a fluffy? I don't, I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know. There you can this, have it, mate. There we was just this, like <laughs> puffy cube, and it, well, I don't. The puffy cube can't even fit a baby on it. So I'm like, what is this for? And then also we had this lovely lady round called Anita. Being like, right, this is what you need for the house. Then we, well, our house is over five floors. So, like, right, changing table and everything. And I'm thinking, changing tables. I'm an Ikea. Looking, I'm like, not aesthetically pleasing. So I say to Anita, I've seen this beautiful antique butcher's block, which actually probably worked for the right height. <laughs> Anita looked at me like I told her, like, I was going to probably sail up the um, river in a Moses basket. basket. <laughs> I actually literally looked mortified at me. I was like, oh, it would have looked fantastic in the kitchen. The changing table, I thought it was quite innovative. So, yeah, it's, it's a bit daunting. you just need a changing mat and a bag. Yeah. In each floor, really? Absolutely. You'll be, yeah. Mm. I mean, yes. You didn't get the IKEA table for every floor. No, not no. the butcher's block. No. <laughs> <laughs> I got the beautiful antique. Um, it's, it's never been used, it's fine. But no, we do have the most enormous collection of stuff arriving in our house at the moment. And the clothes, I must admit, I'm just. 
I have already. Obsessed. I bought them their Easter outfits for 2024. You have. Matching, you bought the Christmas beautiful. outfits. Christmas already. outfits. I don't even know how big they're going to be or what's going to be going on, but you know, if they're going to be wearing jumpers in summer if they don't fit into them <laughs> during Christmas. I'll tell you that for free. They are. Hey, you've got five embryos left. Like, come on, there's going to be hand me downs galore. You've got more children Absolutely. to get through. Absolutely. And the, right, the right now, they are. Wardrobe. They are Ralph Lauren commercials right now. They <laughs> they look like that's very much as my style is that kind of Hamptons preppy kind of all of right. that kind of style rugby shirts. <laughs> And they are both little versions of us. So <laughs> right. They are going to be very sweet, but they... Uh, They've got on or, on or off a boat somewhere. They look, look, yeah, look they, very uh, cute. Oh, it's, it's so sweet. I'm, I'm obsessed. And then you go and you buy kids' clothes and it's just like, and it's just never ending because it gets so much more exciting. Again, oh, it's, it's part of the joy of it. It's go and have yeah. fun with it. We've had difficult parts. Let's go and have some fun. Go around yeah. and pick some fabulous yeah. thing. Go, ooh, every single thing and smell it and hold it and feel the material. <laughs> fabulous. You're waiting. And what can you do when you're waiting? That You know, you've, you've got to fill it in, in a way that makes you happy. You've had four years of thinking about how you're going to parent. Now it's that time where you can start getting those nice bits. I Absolutely. think after after the six weeks, 16 week scan, it got to that point where it's like, right, this this is, you know, we're pretty much there. This is happening yeah. now. And then it's a bit like, let's do something really positive. Yeah. Um, and we are four months to go to the day right now until the babies are, as long as they want to stay until 37 weeks, this is to the day. So... <laughs> we're like, hmm, okay, we actually need to uh, get cracking because that's, yeah. that's going to go very, very quickly. We're over half, well, well over halfway through because yeah. it's twins. They come out at 37 yeah. um, because it's multiple birth. Um, but there's a 30% chance they could come before. Our, our, so, you know, we're just... So let's get cracking. And how are you feeling about the arrival? Like about going into that situation of, your, you know... Are they arriving by C-section? Yeah. yeah. So how are you feeling about looking ahead to being in that room? You know, is it? It's always, it's going to be nerve wracking, isn't it? It's always going to, and it's just going to be more and more. And it's kind of like, it's, I don't, I don't know how. how I, 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 if I'm honest, I haven't really, again, it's a step by step situation yeah, yeah, after yeah. going We've through. We've got our 20 week scan, no, 20, right, 20, 21 winter 20. On, on Tuesday this week. Um, and then obviously we had a scan last week. That's uh, because we do it every week. Um, and it's kind of just, even though it's 16 weeks away, it still doesn't feel that close. Yeah. Um, but I just... Does it feel close enough? Yeah. It, but it's exciting. Like, we're looking at, um, what are they called? The sleeper cots. Cots, what, the ones going next to our bed? Snood. 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 Oh, and yeah. then, Snood. And then I'm like, I'm reading about colic and like these little things you have up and like mm -hmm. makes it all better. And I'm like planning. And already I go to bed at night. I'm like, right, one's going to be there. One's going to be there. And then, you know, I'll get up in the night, do a dream feed, all of this sort of thing. See, I know some of the terms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't even done NCT yet. <laughs> um, Haha. -ha, I've read a book. Um, <laughs> But um, are you doing NCT? Yeah, we will. I, in the bump do, class. Do you know nice. the yeah. thing for me is just um, the um, medical side, like all yeah. the sort of you know, all, all the just if anything goes wrong or whatever. And oh, the baby first aid and things like that. Yeah, because I think I, imperative. No, that would be. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm, and we live because we're in Chelsea, just around the corner of Chelsea Westminster. So otherwise, I'm just going to be neurotic all the time and just be like both babies under arms running down to the hospital. But like, one's got a cough. It's like go home. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, it's just. Where does a worry stop? <laughs> no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Oh God, I need medication on something. <laughs> I'm, I'm already my anxiety is up. Woo! But that is something. Mum always goes. Well, this is it now. You'll always worry till they're till they're. Yeah, you never stop. The trade-off is love, though, isn't it? I mean, yeah. the fact is that you know, I, I think ahead to when they're going off to you know finish school, going off to uni when they first their first boyfriend, the first Let's girlfriend. Get them born first. I know, but it's just <laughs> such a romantic thing, isn't it? Yeah. I think about my upbringing. I had such an amazing upbringing, and I, I funny enough, my dad filmed the other day for the first time for this new pilot that we're doing, um, and um, I filmed with him, and I was just like, Christ, you're just such an amazing dad. I'm an emotional blood woman. Rest. Tears like, I did burst into tears. I was talking about my mum, so it just makes me upset. But I was just like, I was like, I hope I could be half the dad you were. And it's like, I wasn't that good a dad. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you were. <laughs> like through the tears. And then I'm just thinking about my upbringing and then like, all those monumental moments. And I'm just like, God, the, that, the worry and all of that, the trade-off is we get that. You know, mm. We get to have all these moments. And it's just, oh, I'm just so excited to have a family. It's going to be so much fun. I just, oh, for me, it's, it's something that I just, I think after all of this time, it's the most enormous adventure that we want to that we want to bring these two fabulous things into the world and to let them just have this world adventure. And it's, I, I, for me, actually, that, it, this is where life starts. Yeah. A lot of people say to me, and always have done. My friend Richard always says, as soon as you have a baby, you're no longer the lead character in your own book. So true. And I have 
I've never wanted to be the second character more in my entire life. Um, this is their journey now. Mm. And this is a lucky in the position that we can sit there and try and guide them through as best we can. I think that's like back to when you said about the boarding school thing in the beginning. And it's kind of like, do you want those like pauses throughout life? And that's when I was thinking about it. I was like, God, no, I don't want these kids to board. I want them with us all the time because it's going to be such a monumental thing. Like, what, how old were you when you went and boarded? Eight. I think I was nine. Nine. Okay. So like, imagine then you've, got, you've done this for nine years and suddenly this thing's gone. And then you're like... I'd feel like, what, what am I going to do for five days? I'm going to twiddle my thumbs and miss my kids. <laughs> you know, and that's that's why. And now it's just like, and that's overarching all of this, talking about buying the clothes, talking about this journey, the anxiety, all of that. All I really want is a family. Mm. And I want that for us. And I just want that, you know, that closeness, what I had, which I grew up with. I want to replicate what I grew up with. And that's what I can't wait for. Thank you. I, I absolutely love that. And, and, and the other thing that will have a massive effect on is you as a couple. Because it's a whole new, you know, adventure that you're leaping into together. Yeah. How am I without sleep? Not great. <laughs> <laughs> but you know it. And I think self-awareness is the biggest thing when it yeah. comes to, you know, working things out as a couple. If you know you're not good, that's, that's, that's great. I, 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 I'm literally, I'm like a narcoleptic. I can just sleep everywhere, can't I? You've, you absolutely frustrates you. So. Yes, you do. You fall asleep in 30 I seconds. I, w- I wake up every single day between 3 a.m. and 4 a.m. Really? Yeah, which drives me insane. Every single morning, including this morning, and uh, and so he, he goes, "You're right." And I said, "He's like, oh, witching hour." And I'm sitting there, I wake yeah, up I'm on my phone, he, he, so I'm getting phone. used to waking up in the middle of the night anyway. Yeah. So it's fairly all right. That's so fine. you can do the night. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind like doing that. I, no, it's fine. Actually, you know what? The night before, I went downstairs and let the dog out for a wee. Well, I'm very proud of you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, if you could write a letter on fatherhood or on being a parent, who would it be to and what would you say? I think definitely to myself three years ago when we're going on this journey and just being like, and it was just that last time where I just had this pit of like, this isn't going to happen for us. So, you know, it was even, it was such a short time, but you just feeling like you're on pause that entire time. Yeah. And also just to your younger self, I think, is always going to be important because you mature so much. Like, you know, when you get to that point, you're like, right, I want to settle down now, right, I want to get married, like all this sort of stuff. And it's just kind of like, I think especially to myself, like I didn't come out until I was quite, how old do I, my dad, I told my dad when I was 28. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was dating, wait, was I dating? Oh, just before I started dating, I was my boyfriend before for a couple of years and didn't work out, obviously. <laughs> He's not still around. No, we're still together. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think, yeah, if I think about it, do you know what? I would be like writing a letter to myself being like, look, not only you'd be able to come out, because I thought I'd just have to stay in the closet my entire life and it, I'd never get to that point mm. and I couldn't live the life I wanted to live, yeah? Because you make up this big thing in your head. I yeah. sort of realised I was gay from like 14, 15 years old. So you create this entire narrative and story in your head how it all plays out, how you're going to be on your own and all that stuff. My mum got ill and then I was a bit like, hang on a minute, you got one life, go and live it how you want. If everything falls away, it's not meant to be. And then, you know, fast forward down the line, I'm married to the love of my life, we're about to have kids. Like, the way that I saw this happening when I was younger was a lot lonelier than where I am now. Yeah. And my life is full. And my family are so incredibly close, so incredibly loving. And it's a lesson to myself ratifying the fact that the love that my family have for me is mm-hmm. inconsequential. I could do anything and it doesn't go away. It really is unconditional. Yeah. And I think probably if I think about it, that would be, you know, the, 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 not, it's not even the finish line. Well, you know, we're not even halfway through the race, but, you know, getting to this point in the race, it really is, it, it really does look a lot better than I thought it was going to. Yeah. Lovely. I think for me, um, I have a friend who who came out at 19 and his parents sent him away to Utah to go to a conversion therapy camp. Um, Ironically, this is the first time he had sex with a man. (laughs) Um, What did they expect? (laughs) Absolutely right. Came home and said to his parents that um, he was still gay and they kicked him out and have never spoken to him ever again. And he was 19 years old. He's gone on to become a billionaire and has been one of the most extraordinary men you will ever meet through pure dedication to prove to himself that being different is an asset in whatever manner. My letter would be to any person out there, to any parent who thinks that their child being different is a disadvantage when I think that actually it is 
something more to be celebrated, to be different, whether in whatever manner their assets, they, they are assets in themselves, in whatever they are. Kindness, I think, is just the most important thing. And I genuinely believe that parents out there need to realise, a lot of parents out there need to realise that your child being different is such a fabulous thing. I look back at my own school life and the most popular kids right now are not the most popular kids. Mm -hmm. And yet the people that are different are the most successful and the ones that are going through life in the most fabulous way. And I think it's a very, very good omen to be just a little bit different and to sometimes not fit in because I think fitting in then sometimes means that that it's uh, no, not fitting in then means that one day life is going to fit in with you much better than you'd ever imagine. Yeah. And what a joy. And to, to warm yourself up into this new role, you've become a children's author. Absolutely right, yes. Tell me more. Now, this has become something that I have um, loved for such a long time. Um, the idea of a bedtime story for me is just wonderful. And the idea we get to do that. Is it something that you really look forward to, to, to the, having that moment of closeness and storytelling? And He does all the voices any time he reads a book. Of course, he's looking forward to it. <laughs> Absolutely. I just think it's such a wonderful thing to be a part of fantasy and magic and all that kind of stuff before you go to bed, before you go off to the land of Nod, before you yeah. go off on your own dreams and your own adventures where your imagination takes over mm -hmm. and you are your own storyteller when you're going through your dreams. And so I came up with a little character called Henry Boggett, mm -hmm. who's a little boy um, who finds magic in London by realising the blue plaques in the walls where people used to live are actually portals back into their world. I love this. When That's I read so that, I yeah, I don't know how this hasn't been done before so, because it's such a beautiful idea to be able to leap into their world. I am so beyond excited about this. And this the first one is Henry Boggett, uh, Far Away Avengers of Henry Boggett and uh, the Great White Whale. So he goes back to 1851 into Nantucket and goes into the world of Moby Dick through Herb Merville's um, plaque. And it's just a glorious story where Henry always becomes the protagonist, a part of the story as if he always was. Um, what's great about this, this series of books is we're doing two a year. And so we're doing one every April and one or every October, carrying on. And the second one I'm so excited about as well. But the first one... <laughs> Out. It's always that thing as an author yeah. when you know what's coming next. Absol you're like, oh, I have to talk about what's coming. First. I know. I'm not going to. Yeah, I'm not going to tell anyone. Um, but this is actually out today. Um, oh, out today. Um, so um, that's Happy publication day. Thanks very much indeed. Um, and so it's really exciting. And it's just it's it's five to eight year olds, or five to ten year olds, and it's it's educational but magical. And before they go to bed, it's just something that they can sit there and read and just and and go into a magical world of, of little Henry Boggett. And they're super accessible as well. Yep, super accessible for everyone. Yeah, and also I've made it so they're not hardbacks. Yep. And so that you can put them in the, the, mm -hmm. the bottom of the trolley, you can, you, anywhere you want, in the, um, the buggy, you can put them anywhere you want and, uh, and go travelling with them. And the other thing adventure. is there are just so many blue plaques. This is endless, Ollie. There's 900 and something. Whoa! I mean, so, some people are going to be a bit like, oh, I don't want to dive into that one. But on the whole... Absolutely right. I'm not sure we'll do Bob Marley's quickly. Um, <laughs> yeah. but I'm not quite sure how that would go. Uh, but there are some just heavenly ones. And also, may we add, very important ones yeah. of st people that, that haven't been spoken about. But that is wonderful about these stories is that you can tell it in a way that's bite-sized for children and to get them interested in old school literature. Mm -hmm. If you've ever tried to read Moby Dick, I mean, don't. It really <laughs> does go on. That's not the and point. You're meant to encourage people but to read no, it. it's so long and so it's so difficult to read. And uh, and so we do it in a bite size. And also do it with a bit of magic. We're doing yeah. it. The white whale is not as scary as you think he is. I yeah. think one of the most amazing things as well is the fact that you can actually physically go to these places and see the blue mm -hmm. plaque. What street is a blue plaque on? Craven Street. There we go. He knew. I was going to ask him. Thanks very much. Getting a little test yeah. there. Mm. <laughs> it was a little test. Haha. Uh -huh. We'd have edited it in. Just behind well. the Corinthia Hotel if you want to see yeah. it. Yeah. Nice. Um, so these places actually exist. So it's, it's always interesting when you can take um, a work of fiction and then go and physically have something yeah. in the real world because it, it sort of plays, especially for kids, it really sort of, you know, they come to something. that world alive. Go. Yeah, it's what's that clock in um, the Natural History Museum? Oh, it's um, Ollie, not, not Timmy's Ollie's clock. clock. Timmy's it's clock, something. There's a clock in Buzzle there. Buzzle watch it almost 100%. There's a BBC. The... Um, uh, is it Andy? Andy's, Andy's yeah, clock, yeah, yeah. 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 And then kids are like, I want to go and see Andy's clock. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. it's in the Natural History Museum. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it's a really sort of educational, motivating thing for kids. And I think, yeah. that's, I think that's one of the most amazing things. 
Amazing. And it's beautiful. Very, Thank very you beautiful. very, very much. I hope you're planning on celebrating today. Oh, I will be, 100%. Good. <laughs> we end each episode of the podcast with you completing three sentences. So I've modified the second one slightly. The first one is, being a dad means... I think for me, being a dad means family. And the, uh, the family that I knew that I grew up with. Mm-hmm. And, that's, and that, for me, has always been a goal. Being a dad is letting someone else take the spotlight and letting them do whatever they want to do in their lives to make them as happy as they possibly want to be. And I think that's, that's for me, the most important thing. Beautiful. Um, since starting this journey to become a dad, I... I'm skint. <laughs> <laughs> um, I... It's not going to get any better, Ollie. That's fine, right. yes, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, we need to work hard. Um, how realised how magical the whole community of people that struggle to have children are. Mm -hmm. Because when we were struggling, they were the people, and I'm still in contact with many of them, and we're supporting each other, many from America or wherever, I have never met. Um, And yet we speak to each other, and some of those people know before my parents that we're pregnant, or we were pregnant, um, because those are the people that were holding my hand or her hand through that. And the community online is when you're struggling, when Mm. when you need a hug, they're there and they don't see you at that point as someone on television. They see you as someone going through the same issues they are. Yeah. And that for me was fairly magical. And so, yeah, that was that for me. Yeah, I think but since starting this journey, I think it's just humbling. You know, you're you're part of this community and you're all on the, you're on the same journey together. So, and it's that's that's the main thing that sort of keeps you sane. Yeah. And finally, I'm happy when. I'm happy when I'm in bed by nine. <laughs> 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 um, I'm happy when I'm with Ollie. I literally I'll ring him every hour if I'm not with him. But I miss you. It's, I do, I'm, and we're always with each other. We're very we're very sort of sim, sim, symbiotic. Symbiotic. That's the word. Sounds a bit weird. Um, but yeah, I'm happy when I'm with Ollie. I'm happy when I look forward to what's going to be happening in the future. If we're by the seaside or something like that, first adventures, first memories, first. Everything that's that's I think my happiness, and that would be my happy thought if I was trying to fly in Peter Pan. What a beautiful way of of, of ending, and that's gorgeous. Thank you so so much. I I am so excited uh, for you to to have your babies in your arms, and I want you to come back actually. You know, have a year down the line, and and let's regroup. Crying babies in here. <laughs> yeah, that'll be fun. We've had edit. babies in here before. Don't you worry. <laughs> we'll but, do it. There'll be years to it. Thank you so much for having <laughs> us. Thank you so much. It's been lovely. <laughs> thank you.